Hi, Bill Vales here for another edition of Fun with Science, and I'm here with Tony DeAngelis, mm -hmm. still. Right, um, still with the magnets. We're, we're, we're doing a um, <laughs> marathon on magnets today, <laughs> and magnetism, Right, uh, and it's a uh, very, very interesting, I have to say. Uh, Tony, let's um, talk a little bit about uh, the different types of magnetism. Okay, uh, magnetism is generally broken into three parts. Um, you have ferromagnetism, which is a magnet, permanent magnet, say just attracting a piece of steel. Okay? okay, that's the first one. The second one is paramagnetism, which can be demonstrated, but it's things that are under certain circumstances magnetic. And one of those, oddly enough, is liquid oxygen. We did that in Virginia. We made some liquid oxygen and poured it in between two computer hard drive magnets separated by two pennies on either side, so there's a small gap. Pour the liquid oxygen in, and it forms a little sphere. But the ball is, is suspended in the magnetic field, and it just quivers there as it slowly evaporates into nothingness. And that's paramagnetism, certain things under certain conditions. Certain may, uh, I've heard certain metals like uh, that aren't normally magnetic, but if you put them in a very strong magnetic field and gently tap them, the atoms will align to make them somewhat magnetic. I see. And then the last one is diamagnetism, which is an actual repulsive force of a magnet on certain objects. And until recently, that could not be demonstrated outside of the lab having real expensive and sensitive equipment. It's so, mm -hmm. such a small effect. Mm -hmm. One of the things I heard is absolutely pure water is diamagnetic. Copper slightly, bismuth more so, but the most diamagnetic that we've been able to find and uh, make it demonstrable is pyrolytic graphite. And that <clears throat> they make from, in a furnace I think of 2,000 degrees, they precipitate <clears throat> on a sheet very thin layers of, uh, of carbon, and that's what this is. It's pyrolytic graphite. <clears throat> it's very light so mm -hmm. that you can see the uh, you can see that uh, that is is a very light material, and it is diamagnetic. So when you okay. put it on a on a very potent magnetic field, like these four neodymium magnets so produce, the, the neodymium, neodymium okay. super so a regular this, magnet would not do it, but a neodymium put will. This on here. And you can see that it actually floats above the surface. It is. Yeah, it, and yeah. You tap the table right. a little bit, and you can see it floating. Yeah, that's it. The thing yeah. is is actually floating on the surface because it's being repelled by the magnet rather than attracted. And uh, that's one of the few substances that where it's easily demonstrable and it's great. Very interesting. Yeah. So now, those are the now I guess the, the, the type that we think of most often is the uh, ferromagnetism. Right, a magnet that attracts yeah. iron, steel, yeah. and like that. This is a very uh, interesting, we could play with this Oh, it is, for yes, hours. right. I do, believe me. Shaking this. Um, and as far as playthings go, there's yeah. so much stuff you can do with yeah. the magnets. Um, yeah. One of okay. the things uh, I did was I made these boxes. It's this not none, It's not too, uh, too great as far as the construction goes, but um, I, was, I had one that I made years ago with the powdered iron, uh, iron filings, and I threw it out. Uh, what I used here is uh, I'm using uh, magnetite sand, which is a high-quality one that I got from a person who is uh, selling it, and it comes from Oregon black sand, and according to him, it's pulled seven times with magnets to get all the impurities out, and what's left is pure magnetite sand, and so you can use it to demonstrate the field of a magnet. Oh, isn't that interesting. So it's just, it's another plaything, but it is kind of funny that you can you know, use that in in uh, in many ways as a demonstration tool. Yeah. Now, I think most of us uh, older people mm -hmm. remember those uh, little uh, faces. Yes, and you uh, put the bed, yeah, the, the eyebrows, and you can or the, put the beard. eyebrows, right, the beard. right, yep, um, exactly. This has certainly taken it up a notch. Well, yeah, I, you know, when I uh, the first time I heard about this stuff was when I got uh, one of my 
earliest rock collections, and one of the things in it, it said magnetic sand. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I looked it up, I can't find any reference to, to it, but it's actually magnetite, magnetite. sand. And I have a, a big bottle of it uh, downstairs, but this guy, it's high quality, and so you can use it for stuff like this. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, you know, when you glue this stuff together, you have to glue everything so you can't take it readily apart and change things. Mm -hmm. But it's a nice thing. So it's basically magnetite sand as a demonstrator yeah. of magnetic field. Yeah. These are wonderful vehicles for demonstrating the concepts, taking them to school. Right, exactly. Um, I used to do that when uh, uh, my, my nephew and niece were in grade school. I do you know, demos with all of this stuff. Boy, can this really capture the interest in the in a oh, hands on sure, it would, yes. In a hands on manner. Well see that's manner. the thing, you know, when you do stuff like that it it does add something yeah. to it. And, and and the magnetite, we talked about the magnetite in the first show where yeah. we, you know, we had a uh, piece of magnetite. Yeah, right. That you had. Very interesting. And I think I believe that the most of this sand came from Oregon. Oregon. There was a place where the guy uh, goes and uh, digs it up, and then he has to spend hours yeah. and hours getting all the impurities and regular sand mm -hmm. out of it. So he uses a powerful magnet yeah. and sifts it, and then he goes afterwards and does it yet again. And he says he goes through seven steps of doing that to get all the impurities out and have that. And the magnet, magnetic, uh, the magnetite sand is very high quality. Very interesting. Now, another thing that we can do just as a plaything is this, and I'm sure you're familiar I love this with stuff. ferrofluid. Look and that, point that to the, look at yeah. this. Um, I'll put it down here, where you can see it more, but the ferrofluid is wonderful stuff. I've heard that they have uh, colored ferrofluid now, somehow or other they've colored it. I want to get some of the gold, but uh, I haven't got around to it yet. But this is, uh, this is beautiful stuff, and you can make all sorts of designs. And they show some stuff on, on YouTube with people making, uh, looks like the Taj Mahal out of ferro mm -hmm. fluid, but you can yeah. play with it. And so the, the, um, the material in mm -hmm. here is magnetic. Yes. And would that be magnetite? Um, I believe it is like microfine magnetite and okay. some kind of oil. The problem some type with, of oil. Yeah, the problem with it is that um, if you have regular ferrofluid, I, I ran into this one time, and I poured it into a vessel, you can only see the first time you do it because it, it uh, strains everything. It, it, uh, you know, you can't get it to, to fall down. It coats everything. Oh. This, they say, is a blend, according to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and who knows, maybe it's just plain mineral oil, I doubt it, but mm -hmm. they say it's a blend of 13 chemicals where it'll keep, keep itself separate from the, uh, from the ferrofluid and, and won't allow it to adhere to the glass that it's in. I see. What would be an application for this? Well, actually, they use this in two things that I know of. One is speakers, mm -hmm. and the uh, loudspeakers, certain ones, as a cooling agent and a damp damping agent, and the other is in, in shocks in automobiles. Somehow or other, there's a, there's, a, there's a commercial on TV where the guy says, oh yeah, you know, if the computer controls at 30,000 times a second or whatever, mm -hmm. adjust the field, and by uh, varying the field that the fluid is in, you can get different, I guess, uh, viscosities or buffering action. I see. I've also heard of another application in disk drives. Oh really? Com computer disk drives. Okay, that, that may be. I that, don't know of it, but it, that make use of that's this. possible, right? Very interesting. This, um, I mean, you can stay at it with for hours, yeah. just you know, <laughs> doodling with this. Okay, great. It's like the ultimate doodler. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. I've been seeing these uh, these things that you have okay. for a while, and I'd like you to uh, show this to okay. the audience. Okay, basically, what, you have here. what these are is magnetic viewing film. I viewing got, uh, films. yeah, okay. um, and basically what it is is, um, from all I can find out, my, microfine nickel, uh, in um, and I guess it's flakes more than powder, but okay. it's microfine in oil, mm -hmm. and what it will do is it will show the uh, poles or the magnetic field or anything that you put behind it. 
Okay, let's... Uh... And uh, we can demonstrate it with this little magnet first, okay. and you can see... Oh, well, you can, I'll let you do it, because okay. you'll be showing okay. it there. <coughs> and can you see... So now the magnet is off, now the magnet is on. And this is showing the magnetic, the magnetic fields. Yeah, the magnetic field and the poles and so on. Okay. So that, that gives you quite a good, um, yeah. a good thing. And do you have another magnet that I can I try do, that with? Um, I have to get it. Um, here's the, that powerful horseshoe magnet okay. that you can try. Okay. And then we'll get, oh, I have to excuse me, but I have to grab the rotor magnet. This. I'm not going to try the uh, right piece in the center. Then I'll try the piece over here. Okay. And uh, here's a big, you probably want to use a bigger film for this, but this okay. is a rotor magnet with multiple poles, so that should okay. show up on... Now, multiple poles, can you, um, uh, where is north and where is south? Um, well, this? again, I don't, I'd have to look and uh, check with the ghost meter, but I mean, one would be, they're alternating, north, south, north, south, okay. north, south, north, south, north, south. Okay. So that's an eight pole magnet, and you'll see the individual poles. See oh, all the uh, look at that. as how, as far as how they go. So here we go. And did Kim keep that refrigerator magnet or so not? Here is the see. magnet, and under the viewing film, you can hmm. see the various poles. Okay, and now this one here is. Um, one of the magnets we didn't talk about much is the rubberized magnets and okay. basically it's like a ceramic magnet powder put into a rubber basis and they use them as backing for almost all your refrigerator magnets okay. and it's semi-flexible and usually you'll see multiple lines produced by that type. Every time you go to the bank and they give you a Red Sox schedule it's to stick on the fridge, it's the rubberized magnet. And uh, Or if you're like Tony, you can get a <laughs> magnet that has plutonium right. uh, on it, a uh, refrigerator magnet. Okay, and we're going to put this, okay, and look at the lines of that. Yeah, so that's an interesting little thing. And those are the lines of force. The, yeah, the, the way it's magnetized. Those, those you can't. Uh, you can only get so much magnetism though out of those. I'll put it on this, this one. These experiments do so much to make a fairly mystical force a little more understandable. Well, yeah, that's what it should be. I mean, and it you know, gives you, a, uh, it shows it to you in, you know, the reality of this stuff. Yeah. It's not, uh, it's not just something where you read in a textbook. And uh, that's They're, what the, the value of all this is. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, now. What do we have here? Okay, here. The first thing is the box here. It's just an okay. induction coil. And that is to produce the high voltage needed to operate this device, which is an electron, uh, a cat, basically a cathode ray tube, but it's called an electron beam deflection tube. You have a screen in here coated with a phosphor. When you energize this with electrical current, you'll see a line going across, which is the electron beam activating the phosphor on the screen. And with a magnet, you can bend that, uh, you know, to go up or down, and that is um, that was one of the basic things in physics that was taught long ago, and and it seems like uh, they've forgotten to teach it in recent years. Mm -hmm. But that is the whole basis of television, because television is basically a cathode ray tube where you have an electron beam coming down, and then you had. Um, fixed and uh, 
and electroma um, electromagnet to make the beam scan the phosphor on the front of the screen and create an image. So the image would scan yeah. at different parts of the right. tube. Right, exactly. It would keep on going up, down, yep. and, you know, and mm -hmm. back and forth several hundred times a, a second. And that gave you the image, uh, but it's based on this type of technology, which was the tube. And I'll turn it on so you can see okay. it at least to start. And later on, we'll turn it the other way so the camera can see it. But okay. um, let's see. Okay, so we're going to turn this. Yep. I don't know if I should use this or not, but either way. Um, we're going to. Yeah. And if you turn that to the on position, okay. the switch, so we're going to yeah, turn this on, so that they can see it on see the the uh, beam, and then with the magnet appropriately spaced, uh, placed, you can see it'll bend the beam. Yes. And that bending of the beam is basically the the uh, basis of how television is made. It's uh, and that little screen there is uh, is one from something or other that. Uh, that my uh, fiance had, and it's a small one. And they, you see these, even though cathode rays are not used in regular TVs anymore, you'll see them in our instruments, oscilloscopes, and all that type of thing. So, <clears throat> so they're still used. And 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 the magnet in this mm -hmm. would be around right. around the neck here. Yep, around the neck, and all oftentimes <clears throat> it's an electromagnetic assembly controlled by the electronics to what they wanted to do. I see. But that's, yeah, that's yeah. it, was where they call it the yoke, and that goes around, fits around the, that end mm -hmm. of the tube. Yeah. And that would, uh, I, I, w I would think, change the area of the screen yeah. that, that, the, um, mm -hmm. that the beam gets directed right. to. Right, sure. Uh, very interesting. So that's uh, that's the whole basis for our TVs for years and years with cathode ray tubes. Yeah, TVs aren't like this anymore. No, now they with the they're not, uh, they're not like this. No, anymore. with the flat screens and plasma and uh, LCD TV, it's a different different world. But this whole thing was a concept, and this was widely used in physics classes years ago. But because the technology has changed, maybe. They think it's archaic, and I, I don't think uh, you'd find many of these uh, used in physics classes anywhere. And it's yeah. to teach the principles though, of this yes. stuff. Yes, yes. You know? Very interesting. <clears throat> okay. Well, Tony, what do we have here? Okay. This is another radar magnetron magnet, as you've seen the, with the horn gap magnet mm -hmm. and the C-shaped ones. This is a, your typical horseshoe one. And basically, in the uh, magnetron, there would be two of these facing each other mm -hmm. with the business end of the magnetron in the middle. Mm -hmm. And so these, uh, sometimes you see these massive horseshoe magnets, very powerful as well. And that's also part of what was used in radar. I see. And uh, a lot of these, I think, were either uh, shipboard or land-based because of the, the size, like the big ones you saw downstairs. Mm -hmm. But they're still an interesting part. And years and years ago, as a kid, I saw an advertisement that said "Wasp surplus magnets" from the old Edmund catalog, and had no idea what they used magnets for of that size for. And now we know it's all in the radar work that I was see. used. I and see. this is a very powerful magnet. Uh, as you can yeah. see, you don't want to. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to get, your, get your fingers in there. But that's. Uh, that's a pretty hefty one, probably about eight or eight or nine pounds. Yeah, is that Al Nick? Al Nico five. Al Nico yep. five. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, very powerful. Yeah, it's not easy to get off. Usually, slide We've it really off. really touched on uh, a lot of the applications. Right. Um, right. For magnets in these uh, shows that we've done, and there's certainly a lot of... Oh, um, and uh, there's, there's thousands of others that, yeah. we, you know, that we miss, but I mean, they're used all over in industry and everything else. Yeah, and then, industry, defense. Right. Yeah. And then um, there's the other part of, you know, just uh, oh, having fun with it. Yeah, having fun with it. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, Bill Vale's still here at Tony's. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we have a, uh, uh, a special guest here, Kim Goins. Kim, how are you? Okay, how are you? Good. I'm, I'm great. Um, Kim, I, uh, I see that you're very interested in electronics and uh, all things science. Um, yes, definitely in the physical sciences, especially in electrical engineering. Yeah. And can you give us a few words on your background? Um, well, I started off in physics. I wanted to double major in both physics and electrical engineering, but the situation um, only allowed uh, the you know for the physics um, degree. And then I um, and then in my employment though was mainly in the areas of electrical engineering, and so that's primarily what I've worked on. I see. And where where are you working now? Are you retired or? doing something for a hobby? <laughs> well, the first place, um, power distributions. I worked in the R&D department there, yeah. then the Science Museum of Virginia in their exhibit research and engineering department, and then after that, NRL, the Naval Research Labs, um, and then now SAO in, the, um, in their uh, electrical engineering support. Okay, SAO, Smithsonian Astrophysics. Astral Observatory. Observatory, and where is that based? A Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. And it's affiliated with Harvard University. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you have here? Um, these are the old classic flicker bulbs that um, work quite well to demonstrate the interaction of a varying magnetic field with a fixed magnetic field. Okay. Now the uh, the the varying magnetic field is um, what. Okay, the varying magnetic field comes from the um, the the input mains from the power line, okay. which is varying sinusoidally at 60 hertz. Okay, now so that looks like this. That current, we ought to have a diagram to show. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, but the um, 60 hertz cur sinusoidal current sets up a 60 hertz sinusoidal sinusoidally varying magnetic field around the filament. So that f magnetic field then interacts with the fixed magnetic field of the little permanent magnet that's in the base so of each magnet. Yeah, you can see them in some of these, right. So you can right. see it a little better on that okay. clearer one. Mm. Okay, and what, um, is this the design for? The lower circuit is the, the design for these okay. this set of four, and they're basically in parallel so they can be individually switched. You know, and it's quite simple. <laughs> So why don't you turn them on? And <laughs> for her, it's simple. <laughs> so these are all demonstrating the same properties with different colored bulbs. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, just um, to, yeah. Just yeah. yeah, yeah just yeah, for the. Yep. Yep. And you can see now, de depending upon the spring tension of the um, of the mounting um, brackets in there. Some will flicker more yeah, than like others. This one like this way, one's stiffer. Yeah. It's a little stiffer down in the uh, support leads, whereas that one's not as stiff. So I it, see. So that's more a, a mechanical, mechanical. Yes, mm -hmm. that's due to the mechanical, because yeah, yeah. all of these are getting the same current. So. Okay. So let me turn this off. And, mm -hmm, there we go. Okay. Okay, I'm going to remove this just so that okay. they, we can get the other one into play. All right, what do we have here, Ken? Well, this one demonstrates the difference between an AC current and a DC current. There are magnetic fields interacting with the fixed um, permanent magnet down in the base of the bulb. Okay. And in this one, the AC field will be varying at 60 hertz, just like in okay. the other Again, ones. In the sine wave. Because it's coming from the, um, the power line mains mm -hmm. into the house. Mm -hmm. so. Um, but the DC, that one is coming from a little DC power supply that I um, designed to enable it um, to switch from, you know, via the double pole, double throw switch so that I could um, switch the, the two without them interacting with one another. So what I'm looking at here on the top part of this page is the design for what you built here. Yes. Yep. Okay. What were some of the challenges in uh, building that? The DC side was definitely the most challenging. 
um, because the AC side, you know, can just come right from the mains, mm -hmm. whereas the AC side, I have DC. to go, oh, sorry, where is, sorry, the DC side comes from the mains, but then has to be rectified by a bridge rectifier, and then filtered with a capacitor, and then somewhat regulated with the Zener diode so that its output will be as close to 120 volts DC as possible to match the 120 volts AC on the AC side so that the intensities will be you know pretty much the same. Okay. So it'll give a better demonstration that okay. way. Okay. Okay here's the AC. Okay, and there's the flicker. Right. Yep, like <laughs> before. North this, pole, south pole, sinusoidal. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and this bulb being bigger makes it look like it's... So, because mm -hmm. this is not quite the same as those mm -hmm. bulbs. This mm -hmm. is an older one. So. How old a bulb is that? It's got to be about 15 years old, I'd okay. say. Yeah. And then, and then there's the DC. And look at that steady, yep. steady Solid as she goes. Solid as a rock. Yeah. And that comes from, you know, being able to filter it. Because um, if it wasn't filtered, it would it would wiggle a little bit, and then it wouldn't be as effective of a demo mm -hmm. <laughs> to show the difference between the AC and the DC. Yeah. This design is uh, it, it, you may consider it simple, or at least this simple and this. Yeah, this was a bit more challenging. Yeah, because I had to really <laughs> tweak it to get the bridge rectifier and the capacitor to play right. nice together. Yeah, we're going to take some uh, pictures of this and show it to you. It's a, uh, it it it's really done in a level of clarity that uh, you know, having worked in engineering. Um, yeah, these are very are, clear. Yeah, just hand sketches. So. Yeah. That's great. This is, uh, what was the motivation for doing this? Well, Tony um, had uh, a power supply that he had gotten a while back from, from the company that no longer makes them. And we looked all over the web to see if we could just buy a replacement power supply, mm -hmm. you know, that would go from, switch from AC to DC. You would be surprised at how many that there are no low power power supplies that will allow you to just switch from you know, 120 volts AC to 120 volts DC, just none exist. You know, you could you could get big bench top ones, you know, that are thousands of watts, and you know we don't yeah, want anything no. like that. So, I um, he needed one. And I thought, wow, that would be a nice little electronic <laughs> ch uh, right. adventure. I would like to take on that challenge. Wonderful. So I did. So yep. you designed it, built it. And, uh, she's very good yeah. at what she does, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she looks very good at what she does. Uh, Kim, I know from uh, having talked to you in uh, uh, past times that I've visited here that um, you have quite an interest in science and you have a, a, a lab and uh, I hope at some time in the future you'll invite us back to... Oh yeah, yep, yep. I, I have my own electronics you know, workbench slash lab in the bedroom, yeah. you know, complete with oscilloscopes, signal generators, variax, power supplies, multimeters, <laughs> and all the accessories in between. Yeah. Um, yeah, she does. And, <laughs> and you have quite a light bulb collection. Yes, I do have um, a light bulb and vacuum tube collection in there, along with some other electronic devices of interest in there as well. So, um, yeah, if you would like to come back and, and get a shot of those, I can certainly show them to you. Okay, that's great. Well, we're going to uh, uh, end this um, marathon of uh, <laughs> magnets and, and magnetism. And, uh, Tony, I want to thank you very oh, much. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure. Yeah. This is a fun Kim, type of thing yes. to do. I want to thank you. This has uh, really been um, wonderful, and um, I hope you enjoyed it. It's uh, in the form of a series. I I don't even know how many shows we take today, uh, <laughs> but I think you have to watch them all to yeah, get to get, uh, to get the full picture of them. But uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next time on Fun with Science. Mm -hmm.